Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, their programs help kids and their parents learn about black history, financial empowerment, and more. Plus, a form of dance that's nearly a century old. Why they are hoping new young members step up to learn this art form. And then the spectacular sight of enormous lanterns in the shapes of traditional Chinese elements. But first, where you're invited to go for an educational viewing of tomorrow's total solar eclipse. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. The countdown is on to the last total solar eclipse in the United States for over 20 years before it will happen again. The day the moon passes between the sun and earth, casting its shadow and blocking out the sun is Monday, April 8th, around 2 p.m. And totality for people in the St. Louis area is just a short drive away. These alignments are pretty rare and being able to catch at least one of them really in your lifetime is, uh, is I think very special. Tansu Dailan is an assistant professor of physics at Washington University in St. Louis. He's part of the Laboratory for Space Sciences at WashU Physics. So I study transiting exoplanets, planets beyond our solar system. So the idea is that there is a planet and that planet is around a star. The planet's orbit periodically crosses our line of sight towards the star. So that occults some fraction of the stellar brightness and that allows us to basically first detect the existence of the planet, but then after that figure out something about its size and its atmosphere and even its contents. Aligning his expertise with the alignment of the sun, moon and earth, Dylan will be sharing his knowledge at a free public viewing event in the path of totality. It's at Bollinger Mill State Historic Site, about a two-hour drive from Washington University. Dylan and fellow WashU scientists and faculty members will be providing telescopes and short talks about the history of the eclipses and the science. I will focus on these events called syzygies and the solar eclipse is an example of that but in general if you have three objects in space when they align the observer can gather additional information about the physical system based on these alignments so solar eclipses are such one event where we can get to study the corona and in general there are other alignments many other alignments in the universe that we make use of, so I will be talking about these. The total solar eclipse of 2024 is the last in the U.S. until August of 2044. And this one will be bigger than the one in 2017. The path will be wider and totality will last longer. That's because the moon will be closer to the Earth than it was in the 2017 solar eclipse. This year, the path stretches from southwest Texas all the way to Maine. It includes Missouri and downstate Illinois. In some Missouri cities, totality will last for more than four minutes. This path does not include the St. Louis area, but the daytime darkness is very close by. People should not underestimate the uniqueness and importance uh, and rarity of, of such an opportunity, especially if you're so close to totality already. I think it is, it is definitely uh, worth um, uh, seeing this at the State Park, Bollinger Mill. It will be a little bit of physics and also just, you know, safety around it. And free solar eclipse glasses for safe viewing. Before the totality actually happens, you see the last bit of light, which is known as the diamond ring, and then it goes away. You see these Bailey's beads that are just like spots on the rim due to valleys on the moon. And for a few minutes, you just see the corona, which is a very unique experience and you, you get totality. And during totality, a lot of different things that happen around you, the birds stop singing and it gets a few degrees cooler. Uh, so it's, very, it's a very unique experience. Dylan says this will be the third total solar eclipse he will witness, and he wouldn't miss it for the world. I think everyone should at least you know, see one in their lifetimes. It's, it's, it's a very special occasion. 
For original programming and award-winning content, explore hecmedia.org. Find all of your favorite genres, including the arts and sciences. Go in-depth with the latest research. Get insight into new technologies. Learn about breakthrough discoveries. Find it all in one place. Explore hecmedia.org. Tron Rome is the founder and a visionary of the Legacy Institute. And he was having a conversation with a family member. And she was just talking about her classes and what they were learning. And the agreement was that, you know, we're not getting what we need. Started in the wake of the pandemic, the Legacy Institute is an eight-week program designed to help young people from underprivileged communities achieve success. First, we work with kids from uh, 5 through 18. We also have parent courses that go through the same class that the kids do as well. Uh, we have courses in chess, uh, credit financial literacy, leadership, debate, and black history. The Saturday courses cover subjects that are generally not included in school curriculum and provide kids with the tools they need to navigate throughout life and adulthood. The importance of knowing your history, knowing where you come from, um, helps you to have, move forward with confidence to know where you're going, right? Through debate, you're developing uh, verbal confidence, being able to articulate your thoughts, being able to actively listen. And then through chess strategy, being able to think three moves ahead, not only in the game of chess, but in life. Then we have the credit financial literacy. Not so much as being burdened with how much money you make, but how do you manage what you have so that you are prepared to make more and you know how to manage that to where you will find yourself in the same position as you were before you had it. Uh, so those are the tools we really want our children to carry forward. Well, I've been doing the Saturday sessions that they have. So we come in on Saturdays and we talk about uh, chess, financial literacy. We talk about money. We talk about how to manage it, how to move it around, how to get it, how you can lose it. You have all types of things that's just going to give you an advantage in life, and it's just going to give you that extra boost that you need. I've been in Legacy Institute for two years. I learned how to be a leader, and I learned how to speak up confidently, and I learned elevator pitches. I learned how to save my money and make money. It was fun here, and I like to learn a lot of the stuff from history and debate class. You can make more friends by speaking up and talking to people. Along with the children, parents are provided with resources and free empowerment courses. We are still learning um, a lot of things, and from the financial literacy to um, even if you go into debate, and you know, teaching that confidence and public speaking and. And I think it's very important when kids see their parents invested in the program also. They see how important it is to the parents and therefore it becomes important to them. The Legacy Institute aims to create a lasting legacy that will benefit the entire St. Louis community. This isn't about just a specific group of people. Um, it isn't just about black kids, but no, it's about all of us, right? And how legacy can number one, help to reestablish the value that each person has in themselves our fit in this world, our opportunities in this world, and know that, no, we are not less than, nor is anyone else superior to the other, right? But we can have power in ourselves by believing in ourselves and believing in all the greatness that we're not told about, right? So there's so much information, knowledge, and wisdom um, that can be passed on. And so we're finding out that it's important that we not only talk about it, but we also be about it. We are not reinventing the wheel but we definitely want to make sure that we round the wheel, allow for us to move the ride for every member of our community. A lot of our black children are being motivated and inspired the way that the education system is structured right now. That's why legacy is so important. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. One Saturday per month, you can catch members of the St. Charles Swing Dance Club out there on the dance floor cutting a rug. We focus on St. Louis Imperial style swing dance. There's East Coast and there's West Coast. We all have the same basics and can dance with each other. If you don't have a partner, it's okay. First, we're not beginning.
A then single, John Kranzberg, founded the St. Charles Swing Dance Club back in 1982. When I first moved to St. Louis in like 75, I'd go to the nightclubs. I looked at what was going on. And I saw all the guys who knew how to swing dance. They were getting all the girls, so I decided I was going to learn how to swing dance. His plan worked. Kranzberg is now married and actually met his wife while swing dancing. A lot of the swing dancers are becoming senior citizens or move, you know, getting older, and uh, we have younger people who are getting more into jitterbug, hop, and you know, the bop and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm mistaken, here comes something now. Swing dance originated in the 1920s in Harlem during the Jazz Age. Back then, it was called Lindy Hop. Depending on where you live or your age, swing dance can look a lot different nowadays. We do have people who come to the dance and freestyle. Board member Linda Kinney thought swing dance would be a fun new chapter following a major life change. Well, I've been swing dancing for about 16 years, and I started at the St. Charles Club. Newly divorced, didn't know what to do with myself. They were so welcoming and just such genuine, friendly people that it just was a very social environment and I loved it and have stuck with it since. Ruth Ann Salader has been with the club for five years and in her current role as board president for a year. I've always felt that dance is a form of expression. It's kind of an art expression of art, it's an expression of communication, it's fun, it's a lifetime activity. I would recommend it to everyone. Right now, the club has 12 board members and 109 members. The latter is a number that they are hoping to increase. They want to attract more younger dancers by switching up their music selection. Try to introduce a little bit more, a little bit faster music every once in a while. It seems that the younger generation will dance uh, swing, but they like the music faster. They want to do the Lindy, etc. While the younger crowd likes faster beats and dance moves, this group says they still get a bit of a workout at the end of the night. <laughs> We get exercise, and um, it's it, it definitely good aerobics. You'd be surprised how long a two and a half minute song lasts. But uh, so, are you like sweating at the end of the song? Well, no, no. <laughs> well, at my age, I don't, I don't do that anymore. Everyone has their why for joining the swing dance club or rejoining, whether it's to find that special someone or to find themselves. I was physically enabled to dance for quite a while, and I'll get emotional. And coming back to dance, it just builds me aerobically. It gives me a social contact with everyone. And um, like I said, it's a lifetime sport. I love it. Later on Spotlight, baseball historian John Thorne talks about the game's roots. Welcome to the St. Louis Zoo. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you about Animals Aglow, our Lantern Festival, which is the newest event here at the zoo. If you're coming to the zoo during the day, over the next couple of weeks, you'll see several animal lanterns around the St. Louis Zoo. There are animals, there are plants, there are interactives that you can take a look at during the day. And they're gorgeous during the daytime, but it is something spectacular to see them lit up at nighttime. So the event runs from 6.30 to 9.30 in the evening. It runs Wednesday nights through Sunday nights, now through May 5th. As guests come in, they get their tickets scanned at either entrance. They come in, they see the beautiful lanterns lit up. We have specialty food items for purchase. We have nightly cultural performances in our sea lion arena. So we have artistic hula hooping. We have a handstand acrobat. It's a really wonderful experience to see that cultural performance. And then we have different educational experiences for the kiddos and the adults as well. Guests can also take a walk through Dino Roris, enjoy rides on the carousel, and take part on the train, which will run on weekends only and you can learn a little bit about why the animals and plants in this Lantern Festival are important to the St. Louis Zoo and to our guests as well. 
So the St. Louis Zoo constantly evaluates our events that we have going on, and we realized that we had a gap during springtime, and really a lot of other places around St. Louis have that gap as well. And we saw these beautiful lanterns around some other zoos throughout the country, and had to put out an RFP, and ended up with our vendor, uh, Tianyu Arts and Culture, and they have set up all of the lanterns. They have done an amazing job being a partner with us, and we're super excited to have them here. They provide the cultural performance artists as well, and have actually artisans that came in and hand-painted many of these lanterns that you see at the St. Louis Zoo. The response from our guests has been amazing. Uh, having everyone stop and take pictures at every lantern was something that we weren't quite expecting, but it is so awesome to see. The cultural performance went over really, really well. People seem to be really engaged, um, and it's a nice learning experience. You can learn more about the event at stlzoo.org, and you can also purchase tickets there. We have information about our Sensory Friendly Night, which is on Sunday, April 7th. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys. Tellys. Natoas. Auroras. And other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Considered one of the 20 greatest baseball players of all time, Satchel Paige has a long history with St. Louis, even though he didn't sign with the St. Louis Browns until he was 45 years old. Public historian Adam Cloppy explains. St. Louis is the home of many baseball legends. Players like Stan Musial, Dizzy Dean, and Bob Gibson. But there's one legendary pitcher who had a long and storied history with the city of St. Louis, even though he never played for the Cardinals. In fact, he didn't even play in Sportsman's Park until he had already been a pro for almost 15 years. He's a Hall of Famer and considered one of the 20 greatest baseball players of all time. He is Leroy Satchel Page. The first time St. Louisans got a look at Page, they could have been forgiven for thinking he wasn't that special. The year was 1927, and Page was pitching in one of his first games for the Birmingham Black Barons of the Negro National League, who were in St. Louis visiting the fabled St. Louis Stars. In the game Page started, he didn't even make it out of the first inning. He hit the first three batters he faced. The third batter, Stars catcher Mitchell Murray was so sure that Page was targeting him that he chased Page around the field with his bat, starting a massive brawl between the clubs. Though Page's career got off to a rocky start in St. Louis, he soon became one of the most recognizable names in Negro Leagues baseball. By 1941, Page was such a star that two promoters organized a July 4th game at Sportsman's Park to be played between Page's Kansas City Monarchs and the Chicago American Giants, another Negro Leagues team. But Page was the star. He featured in nearly every advertisement for the game that ran in the city's newspapers. It was to be the first Negro Leagues game played at Sportsman's Park since the early 1920s. Not only that, but for the Monarchs and Giants game, Sportsman's Park relaxed its segregated seating policy. At the time, Sportsman's Park was the only segregated ballpark in the major leagues. But for this game, black fans could buy tickets for seats that they had previously been barred from. The game was a massive success. Over 19,000 fans came out that day to watch Page and the Monarchs dominate the Giants 11-2. The success of the game led to more Negro Leagues games being scheduled at Sportsman's Park and to the eventual segregation of Sportsman's Park itself in 1944. But Page's ties to St. Louis don't stop there. In 1951, only four years after Jackie Robinson broke Major League Baseball's color line, the 45-year-old Satchel Page signed with the St. Louis Browns. 
Over the next three seasons, Page would pitch over 300 innings for the Browns, and he was so good that he became the first black pitcher selected to the American League All-Star Game in 1952. He left the Browns after the 1953 season, but returned to the major leagues for one game with the Kansas City Athletics. In that game, he pitched three innings and even struck out a batter. Not bad for a guy who was about to turn 60 years old. Next on History Spotlight, a scientist, teacher, and inventor, despite color barriers. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place, hecmedia.org. As the Cardinals kick off their 2024 season, we take a look back at how the game got started with the official historian of Major League Baseball, John Thorne. Breeze hits it in the air to center. We will see you tomorrow night. Baseball has long been America's pastime. It has provided exciting and memorable moments our whole lives but what is the earliest baseball moment you can think of? The World Series goes back to 1903. The National League goes back even further to 1876. But when did baseball start? Who invented it? Was it always the American game? Two of the sport's earliest proponents argued over these very questions and in 1905 decided to once and for all find out who was the father of baseball? John Thorne, the official historian for Major League Baseball, tells the story of the quest to find the roots of the game and how its founder was a true American hero. Albert Spaulding and Henry Chadwick had long argued about the origins of the game. Was it English in its origin or was it American? Abraham G. Mills, who had been a National League president, was commissioned by Albert Spaulding to form a commission, which became known as the Mills Commission, to investigate the origins of baseball. Abner Doubleday was a rather famous general at Gettysburg, and he's the first Union soldier to fire a shot in response at Fort Sumter and Mills issued a pronouncement that if there was an inventor of baseball, it was Abner Doubleday, and he was relying on the letters of Abner Graves. Abner Graves wrote a letter in 1905 stating that he and Abner had played ball in 1839 or 1840 in Cooperstown, but this is clearly demented because Graves would have been five and Doubleday would have been 19, had he even been in Cooperstown, which he was not. There is no father of baseball. A good idea has many fathers, a bad idea has none, and baseball has a thousand fathers. Wait, so Abner Doubleday didn't invent baseball? In 1839, Doubleday was a cadet at West Point, not in Cooperstown. In fact, he may have never played a baseball game in his life. A.G. Spaulding printed the story, however, and generations of Americans grew up believing in the Doubleday myth. The real origin of baseball is more complicated, with its influences coming from a variety of games that were played in all corners of the early United States. Town ball is an umbrella term that modern scholars use to describe the great variety of ball games that were played across the North American continent with bat and ball and town ball was characterized by overhand throwing rather than underhand pitching, no foul territory, and one batter out and the side out. The essence of cricket is to hit the ball off the pitch in front of him on the bounce so that there would be no attack on the wicket. If it were knocked down, the batter would be out. Rounders is a game that Chadwick played when he was in England in the 1820s and 30s. And it was played without a bat and was played by boys and girls together. As bat and ball games spread throughout the country, 
players began to alter their various rules, establishing new versions of the games. But it was in New York City, in the mid-19th century, that one team became recognized for their particular rules, while one of its members would make perhaps the greatest contributions to the game that would now be known as baseball. The Knickerbockers are known today as the pioneer baseball club, but they were not the first. The Knickerbockers developed 20 rules of which 14 were for the playing of the game. Our first printed record of them dates to a Knickerbocker pamphlet of 1848. But at that time, the man who devised those rules, William Rufus Wheaton, said that he had developed these same rules for the Gotham Baseball Club in 1837. Yet they were lost. And because they were lost and the Knickerbocker rules survived, uh, we credit the Knickerbockers of the 1840s as the pioneer club. Yet the game that they specified was played to 21 runs in even innings, not nine innings. The base paths were a distance between home and second base of 42 paces. And the first man to record and have adopted the rules at 90 feet and nine innings and nine men to the side was Doc Adams, who devised what I have referred to as the Magna Carta of baseball. It's his laws of baseball, which were adopted in convention in February of 1857. The rules of the Knickerbockers and the other New York teams helped establish a more universal game of baseball, which spread across the country first through traveling exhibition games, then by soldiers during the Civil War. Up to that point, baseball was an amateur game with no officially paid players. But in 1869, a team was established in Cincinnati, Ohio, that would revolutionize the game. Ball players began to be paid under the table, either with direct payments or no-show jobs by the late 1850s. So when the Cincinnati Red Stockings declared themselves a fully professional club for 1869 and posted their salaries, it was the posting of the salaries that was the innovation. Not that they created professional baseball any more than Abner Doubleday created the game itself. It was that they were not bashful about paying salaries. As the years have gone on, the myth that baseball was invented by a future war hero in an idyllic country pasture has given way to stories of the individuals and teams whose innovations helped establish a game that is now enjoyed by people around the world. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who is the father of baseball, but we can still celebrate the game itself. Next week, a new book shows you the show me state in a weird and wonderful way. Plus, the towel man at the St. Louis Blues game. Meet this super fan of the team. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.